how do we sensitize clinicians to the patient's cultural worlds so that way we can better understand what's normal for them and what's abnormal for them? Because only it's once we've done that can we then start to tailor our treatment plans to help our patients in the ways that they need in order to be able to live the lives that they want. I think cultural competence is very important for clinicians uh, for several reasons. First, maybe we can talk about a working definition of cultural competence. Uh, at least the way I see it, I think that cultural competence is the clinician's recognition and appreciation that the patient's cultural identity and background impact their experiences with treatment and uh, with the healthcare process. And so the reason why that's important is because over time, as we see clinicians increasingly pressed for shorter appointments for a variety of reasons, whether it's because they're working in settings where they may only have 15 minutes for a follow-up appointment rather than formally 30 minutes, uh, where the amount of time that they can use for an intake is now 50 minutes rather than a full hour, clinicians need to be able to ask the right sets of questions to get information that matters most for patients. And an awareness of cultural competence helps clinicians do that. Otherwise, we'll be recommending medications and forms of psychotherapy that may not necessarily be suitable for patients given their own routines or what's most at stake for them. That's why I think clinicians should consider cultural competence very importantly. I think that the CFI is the vanguard of cultural competence training right now, not just within psychiatry, but within all of mental health. I think that if you look at the literature and the scholarship around cultural competence, ever since the 1960s when the civil rights movement started to come to the forefront of American society, that healthcare initiatives have tried to keep pace with that. So earlier, cultural competence initiatives were based around race or ethnicity for historically disadvantaged groups. What's exciting about the CFI is that it really asks about culturally relevant variables in the clinical encounter, but on a person-centered basis. So what that means is that rather than make assumptions about what we think the Hispanic patient or the African-American patient or the gay patient may need, we don't make any assumptions whatsoever. We ask a set of questions for patients based on what we know the literature to say is really important in the way that culture affects healthcare. So that way we can tailor our treatment plans for our patients. That's why I think the CFI is the vanguard of cultural competence right now in mental health. So I think that the CFI can be a very, very powerful tool for forcing those of us who are medical educators, who are service clinicians, as well as uh, clinical researchers, to finally start testing outcomes related to cultural competence. So what do I mean by that? If you look at the literature, systematic reviews from internal medicine and from psychiatry have routinely shown that aside from short-term knowledge gains from providers or satisfaction ratings from patients, we actually don't have any evidence that cultural competence training improves outcomes for patients. And when I say outcomes, I mean specifically quality of life, or symptoms. Now, what the CFI does allow us to do is that if we think about it from the standpoint of, say, intervention development, or from how we can implement it within clinical settings, there's a rich scholarship on how to test training. So we can train medical students and residents to do the CFI. We can see if they've done it faithfully now through a checklist that we've created through the center uh, that is being disseminated through the APA. That checklist lets us know whether or not clinicians have done the CFI in a correct way by asking all the questions, and if patients have responded in ways that we think are relevant. So for example, sometimes patients who might be suffering from acute bipolar disorder or psychotic disorders or even dementia may have conditions that interfere with the interview, even though the clinician has tried to use the CFI faithfully. We shouldn't penalize the clinician for that, and at the same time, we should recognize that patients may or may not necessarily be able to tolerate certain kinds of questions around culture. 
But the point being that we can actually test the process of training now to see that clinicians are using the CFI faithfully. Once we hone that, we can then match clinicians who use the CFI to clinicians who provide treatment as usual. And then we can give certain kinds of questionnaires around symptoms or quality of life to see whether over the long run, whether it's three months or six months or maybe even a year, uh, if patients improve. So in that way, I think the CFI is really exciting because we can test training among clinicians and then outcomes among patients. And hopefully that can be the way that we then develop evidence-based approaches, not just for training clinicians with the CFI, but for to have, but on how to implement it within clinical services so that way we can reach the maximum number of patients and the most people can benefit. So I think that the CFI is significantly different from older models of cultural competence within graduate medical education. I mentioned a bit earlier about how certain models of cultural competence are more based around race or ethnicity. And I think that there are several problems with that. The first is that increasingly, many of our own trainees, like for example, some of the trainees who are in the resident class that we teach at Columbia, have increasingly come from these kinds of historically disadvantaged groups, whether they're Latinos and Hispanics or whether they're African Americans. And these trainees often tell us in our Introduction to Cultural Psychiatry class that the recommendations that people give for the black patient or for the Latino patient don't match their realities whatsoever. So these kinds of group-based approaches to cultural competence may actually not match everyday individual experience. The second thing also is that these kinds of group level based approaches to cultural competence often don't recognize that our patients, and forget our patients, all of us, clinicians, patients, and administrators, all have different identities based on the situations that we belong to. So for example, I might be an American whenever I say visit my family in India, but here I'm seen as an Indian American. I might be a husband in certain settings, I might be a psychiatrist in other settings, and we want to get at what is most relevant in any kind of clinical encounter for the patient and how that patient identifies. If we're assuming that a group racial or ethnic based approach to cultural competence is the most important marker of identity for that patient, without giving the patient a chance to tell us what's most important, then we're talking past each other. I also think that increasingly more and more, we have newer groups that are coming to our clinical attention that no longer match the ground realities of what historically disadvantaged racial and ethnic groups needed cultural competence for. So for example, we have lots of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan now returning, and they've got cultural needs that are significantly different. It doesn't matter whether they're black or they're white, whether they're gay or whether they're straight. Military veterans who have suffered traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder or drug and alcohol abuse have very, very different cultural needs as a group than racial or ethnic groups um, who are civilians. For the same, in the same way, our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered patients also have cultural concerns about what it means to come out to their family and friends, how maybe depression and anxiety or substance use are related to that in ways that the healthcare system never took advantage of uh, discovering in the past. We've got more and more folks who are coming out and who are telling us that's important to their care. And so our cultural competence models need to be able to address that. So where the CFI takes us is that it provides us with a list of clinically relevant cultural variables that we can ask all patients and hopefully we can then tailor their treatment plans around what they think is most important to their care. I think that anybody should be able to do the CFI because we've been able to show through looking at the interactions between patients and clinicians. And when I say clinicians, I mean not just psychiatrists, but I mean psychologists and social workers as well, that in looking at those interactions, the CFI has been able to improve medical communication in ways that neither patients or their clinicians anticipated. So what do I mean by that? In particular,
patients and clinicians tell us certain things that overlap. And for specialists in medical communication, these kinds of domains are really important. So patients and clinicians tell us that the CFI helps get the patient's perspective across. It's not just a list of symptoms that a clinician is asking about to say make a diagnosis of major depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder, that we're letting patients speak and tell us what's most important to them right now in this moment in their care. It also gives lots of open-ended information and that patients can feel comfortable using those questions. Now, if you're like me, when I was going through my residency training and even in medical school, we would often do lengthy family and social histories, but oftentimes it was difficult to see how that information could be integrated directly into a patient's care. In the CFI, we ask patients directly, so who among your family, friends, and close associates has been able to improve this problem or has created stress to this problem? And that, I think, is more clinically relevant than having a list of people who the patient may or may not live with or a list of siblings and family members who the patient may or may not be in contact with. And so the kind of information that a patient pro can provide us through the CFI is very clinically rich. What's very interesting from clinicians is that they tell us that many times when they use a CFI, certain kinds of information come out that would not have been anticipated otherwise. So for example, when clinicians from the DSM-5 field trial would debrief with us to ask about their experiences uh, with the CFI, they would tell us that a lot of psychosocial stressors would come through, like for example, people losing their job in the recession, uh, 2008, and are still unable to get either the same types of jobs that they want or feeling like they're unemployed altogether, like people losing housing, like people talking about family conflicts or inabilities to somehow kind of reach the lives that they want. And there's a certain kind of real depth to the types of information that we get from patients that's not elicited with more, say, biologically attuned interviews that clinicians can do based around diagnoses. Now, what patients tell us is very interesting as well. And it goes against what maybe some of the accepted wisdom is around how clinicians behave. Because the CFI is meant to start the interview rather than to be used as an ancillary after the clinical assessment has been done, many patients feel, because the questions are so open-ended, that the clinician is actually listening to them more. Our studies from the field trial show us that on average, when we use the CFI with the standard clinical assessment, it's about 55 minutes. And of course, there are differences in sites uh, around who was doing the CFI, whether it was trainees or whether it was more established attendings, and whether they were in a managed care setting or not. But given that most standard clinical assessments can be completed in general between 50 minutes and an hour, the CFI may or may, add, may or may not add four or five minutes to someone's interview. But yet, what's interesting is that patients like the fact that the questions are open-ended, that the questions are all designed to elicit information from patients that we say is not right or wrong. It can't be right or wrong, it's about their experiences. And that we can use that information to then tailor the rest of the interview after those 16 questions are asked. The same amount of time is comparable between 50 and 55 minutes, or between 55 minutes and an hour. But the method of asking the questions is different. We're starting open-ended through the CFI, and we're asking questions as necessary that are maybe more closed-ended with the rest of the clinical assessment. And so a lot of patients felt satisfaction just from the use of the CFI irrespective of what the clinician's effects may have been. And so I think that those are, to me, the compelling reasons for why people should use the CFI. The DSM-5 also lists other reasons, like, for example, if there are questions about diagnosis, if there are challenges with either medication adherence or treatment retention, whether there seem to be certain kinds of forms of cultural knowledge that the clinician doesn't want to take for granted, or that the clinician doesn't know about the patient. But I'm a medical communication and health services researcher, and I find the fact that patients like it and clinicians like it because of communication aspects to be really interesting.
So hopefully for clinicians who are interested in using the CFI, aside from these videos and aside from the products that we've been coming out through with the center, they can check out our scientific publications and contact us for additional reasons if they want us to make the case for them.